Okay, hello everyone. Previously, we discussed the cross sections for nuclear reactions, particularly for the neutron induced reactions and the charged particle induced reactions. And now we will discuss how to determine the cross sections experimentally. In fact, the when you irradiate a target in an accelerator or a charge or a reactor, how the Active, active atoms are formed or you can even determine the activity. So if you determine the act activity, you can determine the cross-section. So first let us discuss how to determine how much will be the activity of a reaction product form when you bombard a target with the neutrons or charged particles. So let us discuss in detail the irradiations in the facilities like nuclear reactor and an accelerator. So let us first discuss the nuclear reactor. So, you know, in nuclear reactor, you will have the neutrons all along the moderator system. So, you will have a sea, it's like a sea of neutrons, large amount of uh, neutrons, you know, just diffusing through the medium. And so, when you have a sample, the sample dimension may be, you know, one centimeter cube or so on, whereas the nucleus, neutrons are there all along in a, in a, just say, about a meter cube. So, the, it is like a, sea of neutrons and you put a target, the entire target, all the atoms in the target are exposed to the neutrons. So the neutro, nuclear reactor, so how do you define, how many neutrons are there in the reactor is defined in terms of flux. So across, when you are having a neutron in the reactor, we say this many neutrons are passing through a one centimeter area, centimeter, centimeter square per second. So you have the neutrons going and one centimeter area, how many neutrons are passing in one second, that is called the flux. You can actually, you also call this NV, sometimes in reactor physics, they call NV, N is the number of neutrons per cc into its velocity. So, neutrons per centimeter cube into centimeter per second. So, it will be neutrons per centimeter square per second. Sometimes the, the neutrons are not thermalized, they are having half component. So, Velocities are different. So, you define neutron flux as NV, number of neutrons per cc into velocity of neutrons. So, this is also defined sometimes as neutron flux. Okay. So, you irradiate the sample. So, this, this whole thing is a like a nuclear reactor. Entire target is exposed to neutrons. So all the atoms in the target are exposed to neutrons. And so, when you, the, when you have the target atoms, this is the rate of reaction, target atoms, total number of target atoms, cross section into flux, n sigma phi, rate of reaction. And when you the, the, it is the target is getting activated, then the active atoms start decaying with the rate n lambda. So the net rate of reaction is n sigma phi minus n lambda. So this is the, if we, if we are producing a radioactive isotope as a product of a nuclear reaction, then the rate of formation of the uh, the net rate of formation is Tn by Gt, this is the growth minus decay part, like you know the, the radioactive decay chain. So Nt is the number of target atoms in the sample. If you have the weight in gram, then you can multiply by Avogadro number, and divide by the mass number, if it is a monoisotopic target. If it is a multi-isotopic multi target, then you have to find the abundance of that isotope. So, in that particular isotope, how many atoms will be there, you have to calculate. So, weight is the weight of target, W is the weight of target in gram, A is the mass number of a target, for example, if it is a monoisotopic like cobalt, A will be 59, but if it is a magnesium target, magnesium will have 24, 25, 26, so you have to take the average atomic weight, 24 point something, and a particular isotope of magnesium, 25, 24, which one, so that you have to accordingly calculate the number of atoms of that target. Sigma is the cross section in terms of centimeter square or bond, and phi is the flux which we define in terms of neutrons per centimeter square per second. So, this if you solve this equation, you get activity at the end of a radiation, rate of reaction, 
into 1 minus e raised to minus lambda ti. This is called the saturation factor. We also call this S. So, the saturation factor essentially tells you for how much time you should irradiate the target. There is no point irradiating for a long time. So, you, you can optimize the irradiation time from this graph. So, actually, if you see, if you see here, this if you plot this S here, then this factor will become 1. And when Ti equal to T half equal to Ti, it will be 0. Point this is T half. So, if you irradiate for one half life of the radioactive that you will produce, you will get 50% activity. And after about three, four half lives, you will find that you will saturate the activity. So, you cannot, you do not gain anything by irradiating more than three, four half lives. So, usually you irradiate for one to two half lives of the radioisotope that is sufficient to produce optimum activity. So, this factor is deciding how much is the irradiation time and this decides the rate at which the product is formed. So, activity at the end of irradiation will be following again the same graph as the saturation factor. So, let us do an exercise to know, now it is better to get a feel of how many becquerels or how many curie we produce when we irradiate certain amount of target. So, that will also tell you how much we can irradiate in the, in the reactor. So, let us calculate the activity of cobalt 60, cobalt 60 and gamma 60 cobalt, this is the reaction, cobalt 59 is a monoisotopic target, we capture a neutron and by emission of prompt gamma, we come to the ground state of cobalt 60. This ground state will emit, this is the half-life of 5.27 year to 60 nickel by emission of 2 gamma rays, 1172 and 13. So, I have given a problem here. One gram of cobalt is irradiated in Dhruva reactor. In Dhruva reactor, the flux is 5 to the power 13 neutron per centimeter square per second and time of irradiation is 1 year. Half life of cobalt 60, 5.27 years. So, this is the equation we use for neutron induced reactions. N sigma phi, the rate of reaction into saturation factor. So, Nt number of target atoms, 1 gram will contain this much upon 59 atoms. So, this many atoms are irradiated. Sigma 37.2 bonds, so 37, 3.7 minus 23 centimeter square. Flux is 5 to the power 13 neutron per centimeter square per second. And the saturation factor now 1 minus e raised to minus lambda Ti. So, you can write 1 minus e raised to minus 0.693 into time of irradiation 1 hour, 1 year on 5.27 years. So, the quantity in exponential has to be dimensionless. So, the time of irradiation and half life should have the same units. If it is in years, then it should be also in years. So, we have to have to take care of the units. So, this factor becomes 0.1236. So, if you multiply these factors, you get the activity and the end of irradiation 7.03 to the power 11 or 19.01 Curie. We divide this by 3.7 into 10 power 10. This is the one back, one Curie. So, you can see here, you irradiate one gram of cobalt in a reactor for one year and you get about 19 Curie of cobalt 60. So, that gives you an idea the how much activity of cobalt 60 you will get if you irradiate certain amount of cobalt in a reactor for the some amount of time. Now, let us see the irradiation of targets in the accelerator. Unlike in the reactors, when we have a pond like a pool, like a swimming pool, you have a lot of neutrons moving around and the sample is having very small dimensions. So, all the target atoms are exposed. In the accelerator, the target, the projectile is a beam of dimensions 1 or 2 millimeters. So, you have a very thin beam of projectile bombarding the target and this is the, so this is the vertical view. So, if you have a target like this in a cross-sectional area, beam will be like this if you see in the perpendicular direction. 
So the entire target is not exposed to all the charged particles. Very small area is exposed to accelerator particles. And so you normally know the charged particles cannot travel much in the target. So you use very thin targets of the order of few microns. And if you recall the your lectures on thickness, then thickness you write in terms of if it is centimeter, then you write rho gram per centimeter cube. So you write gram per centimeter square. Gram per centimeter square is very thick. So normally you will write milligram per centimeter square. So in terms of actual thickness, it will be in microns. So because the, you don't want to stop the beam, if the beam will stop, it will generate the heat and the energy will be reduced in that. So you use very thin targets and again, how do you produce the activity? So the rate of production of radioisotopes, dn by dt, reaction rate and sigma i. You don't have a flux now, you have an intensity of the targets, a projectile minus n lambda, a rate at which the radioisotope is decaying. And again, the solution of it is the similar to that in neutron induced reaction, reaction rate into saturation factor. Now that empty the number of target atoms per centimeter square, which you can get from the thickness. I is now that intensity, we don't call it a flux, but number of particles per second. So if you have a target, here you put a Faraday cup. So how many particles are heating the Faraday cup? You can count them. So you like normally, you know, when you irradiate, you call it a current. Beam current will be in nano ampere, micro ampere, milli ampere. And so you dump all the beam. So the, the, the particles, the charged particle will not be stopped in the target. They will induce reaction and go ahead with lower energy and will be collected in the Faraday cup here. So you can have the integrated charge and find out how many particles were hitting the target and then divide by time you get the particle intensity per second how many particles are hitting the target in one second. That is what is called the beam intensity. Many times you may have thick target, suppose the tar projectile energy is not very high, then the tar projectile may stop in the target and then all the beam will be stopped. So you have to determine the current from the Faraday cup. This itself can be taken as a Faraday cup. So the saturation factor again, one minus raised by lambda Ti will again the, vary the same way as in the case of neutrons. So you can decide at what time you should stop the irradiation. So ultimately, the, the formula for the activity of the, tar, the project radioastrope is again 1 sigma i, 1 minus h to lambda ti. Now let us again do an exercise to see how the activity can be generated in the accelerator irradiation. And prior to that, it is important to know how to choose the energy of projectile and what energy and what projectile we use to want to produce a particular radioisotope. So this is the important exercise to know if you want to produce a particular isotope by charged particle induced reaction, what target, what projectile and what energy we should use. So let us give and do an exercise. We want to produce thallium 201, which is used in the oncology for the stress test. If someone you know undergoes some heart problem, if the doctor wants to know what part of the heart is become infructuous, that means the blood is not flowing and you can inject thallium to not one activity and see, the, you can monitor the activity of this isotope in the bloodstream and see whether the heart is receiving the blood, all part of the heart is receiving blood or not. So this isotope you want to produce, the reaction that can be used to produce this isotope is thallium 203 P3N proton induced reaction on thallium 203 followed by emission of three neutrons giving rise to 201 lead and which is emitting beta minus 2 thallium 201. So we have proton beam accelerators from acclotrons and now let us see how do we, what is the energy of projectile proton that we should be using. So target is fixed 203 thallium projectile is proton. How to fix the energy? What energy will give you 201 lead? Because there are the, there are actually the different channels like 3 neutron, 2 neutron, 1 neutron, depends upon the, what the energy of proton. So let us try to see first is the Coulomb barrier. 
the proton should cross the coulomb barrier of thallium 203 so for that you use the reaction the equation r this one this is the factor 1.44 Z1, Z2, R0, A1, one third plus A2, one third, that is 13.2 mg is the Coulomb barrier. Now, when you bombard thallium with proton 204, lead will be formed and it should be excited to such an extent that it should emit three neutrons. So, the excitation energy of the compound nucleus, that is 204 lead, should be sufficiently high emit through typically you know to emit one neutron about 10 MeV energy is utilized because the binding energy of neutron in heavy nuclei will be of the row 7 8 MeV and the neutron will carry some kinetic energy 1 to 2 MeV so total roughly about 10 MeV energy is required to emit a neutron so the excitation energy should be of the row 30 MeV in the compound nucleus so that three neutrons are emitted so the excitation energy of the compound nucleus will be given by ECM plus Q. ECM is the energy available in the center of mass system and Q is the Q value. So let us calculate the Q value. Q value for this reaction mass of the proton plus mass of thallium 203 minus the mass of 204 lead. So that is in terms of delta M value, the excess mass, mass defect values proton thallium 203 and lead 204 so these are the delta m into c square values not the actual masses in atomic mass units so that becomes plus 6.743 mg this is the q value which is positive and as i mentioned for emission of three neutrons roughly 10 mv per neutron that means about 30 mv should be the excess energy so if 30 mv is the excess energy then center of mass energy should be ECM plus Q is 30 MeV, so ECM will be 30 minus 6.73, about 23.2 MeV should be the center of mass energy and accordingly the laboratory energy of proton will be ECM into the mass factor, mass factor is compound nucleus upon target, so it is slightly different, slightly higher than ECM, so it is 23.37 MeV, so if you take a 23.7 mv proton beam bombard the thallium 203 target then excitation energy of the compound will be about 30 mv and by emission of three neutrons you will get 201 lead and then by, thereby beta minus decay will lead to 201 so that is the kind of exercise you can do a priori in fact there are no computer codes by which you can generate even the cross sections and you can simulate the activity, how much activity you will get if you irradiate with this much intensity. Let us do an exercise for the activity that you can get in the charged particle induced reaction. So I have given you a form, uh, active problem. A 0 0.01 centimeter thick magnesium foil is irradiated with for one hour with deuterium beam of current. 100 micro ampere. So currents will be either nano ampere, micro ampere, milli ampere. That can be measured in it by a Faraday cup. Calculate the activity of sodium 24 that is produced at the end of bombardment. So this is the reaction. 26 magnesium D alpha 24 sodium and magnesium has got 24, 25, 26 isotopes. Magnesium 26 is about 11 percent hardness, and the atomic weight of magnesium is 24.3. Now you have taken 0 0.01 centimeter thick. In terms of milligram per centimeter square, you can multiply by the density 1.74 gram per cc to find out the gram per cc. so you can say 0 0.01 centimeter into this much gram per cc will give you gram per centimeter square or milligram per centimeter square you can convert so the number of target atoms per centimeter square will be thickness into abundance into Avogadro number upon the atomic weight 4.74 for 19 atoms per centimeter square number of atoms the current is 100 microampere. 
So you can see here one coulomb per second is one ampere. And so one electron will give you 1.602 10 power minus 19 coulomb. So one coulomb per second will be 1 upon 1.602 10 power 9 So it will be this, this will be this many one, 1 ampere. So it will be 6.24 into 10 power 18 particles per second. So 1 ampere gives you 6.24 10 power 18 and if it is micro ampere then 10 power minus 6. So this will be 6.24 10 power 14 particles per second. So now you can see here that the current you can convert into particles per second. Then the saturation factor 1 minus e raised to minus lambda ti. The half life is 14.95 hours for sodium 24, and you are irradiating for one hour. So, half life should be in the same units. Half life and irradiation time in the same units so will become 0 0.045297. So, now you can calculate the cross section is 25 millibond, 1 millibond, then power minus 27 centimeter square. So, all of them you can put and you can calculate the activity of sodium 24. So, then sigma i and the saturation factor will be 3.33 and power 7 factors. So, you can see here that in the case of accelerators where the beam intensities are low, targets are very thin, you get about millicurie levels of activity compared to the curie levels of activity in reactors. So, accelerators we will discuss more on the accelerate this, uh, comparing the new reactor radiation and accelerated radiation. In general, in accelerators, we get the lower activity because of the, the limitations of the target thickness as well as the particle intensity. Now, we have now got the idea what is the level of activity that you can produce. So let us now work uh, discuss the determination of cross section for the charged particle induced reactions. So, we will take an example of alpha induced reaction on niobium 93 giving rise to compound nucleus 97 and this excited state of nucleus can emit now 1 neutron, 2 neutron, 3 neutron depending upon the excitation energy. So, the variation of the cross section with the energy of the projectile which is called as the excitation function. So, we discussed the reaction cross section which is varying as this one sigma r equal to pi r square 1 minus ec upon ecm. So, that is this. This is the total reaction cross section. But the compound nucleus that is formed, it can emit 1 neutron at low energy, it's still high energy can emit second neutron and still higher energy it can emit third neutron. So, as you increase the energy of the projectile, the compound nucleus is formed with the higher and higher excitation energy and therefore, the different channels are opening up, the different products are formed depending upon the energy of the projectile. So, therefore, when you are measuring the cross section, one needs to measure the total cross section. So, at a particular energy, suppose you want to measure the total cross section, then you will find at this energy you have one product and two product. The sum total of these two will give you the total reaction process. So the excitation functions normally what you do if you do an offline experiment means you radiate the sample, you produce radioactive isotopes and count in the laboratory, you generate this excitation functions by varying the energy of the projectile. So, for this, this uh, measurement, what you do, you measure the excitation function. Excitation function means cross section as a function of energy of the projectile sigma e. And for that, if the products are radioactive, you can do offline experiment. By offline, I mean you irradiate the sample in the accelerator, stop the irradiation, take out the sample from the accelerator, and count the activity in the laboratory on a gamma spectrometry setup and we can form that. So, the same equation is used to find out the process. The activity 
at the end at, at, the, at any time after the radiation is n sigma i sigma is the one we want to determine saturation factor and the after irradiation it may be decaying with time gamma ray intensity of the isotope and the detection efficiency for counting so if you know the target how much target you are irradiating you know the intensity from the faraday cup time of irradiation you know how much time elapsed after irradiation gamma ray intensity and the efficiency if you know you can find out the sigma and the energy at what energy you are doing experiment is determined by this again. So what you have here is projectile is bombarding the stack of target and catch. So this is the target, the red ones are the target and the blue ones are the catch. Why this catch is required that when the target is bombarded, the products may come out of the target by recoil energy and get stopped in the catch. So if you don't put this catcher files, the products of this target will fall on this target and so on. So, it is important that you stop the required products in the next file, which can be a catcher file. This catcher file, which also used to reduce the energy of the projectile. So, subsequent you will find one, two, three, four, five. The six, the five targets will be facing the beam of different energy. So, you have got the cross section measurements at high projectile energies in ordinary perspective. So, this couple. You can count them together in the gamma spectrometry setup and measure the activity and from the activity you can find out the process. So if you are doing the off-lab experiment for the measurement of radioactive evaporation residue, evaporation residue means the one after evaporation of neutrons, whatever residues are formed like technetium 97, 97 giving rise to technetium 96, 95, 94. So these products are radioactive and you can measure their activity to find out the cross section for alpha n, alpha 2n, alpha 3n channels. So this is how the offline experiments are done. And lastly, many a times, you know, the physics community particularly, they would not like to do offline measurement, they want to do online measurements. They want to find out the cross section by online experiment. So here I try to explain the or online experiment. In the online experiment to irradiate a target. So I have shown a photograph of an experimental setup in Pelotron at TIFR. We have this target ladder. And a particular target, if you suppose this is the target, you are exposing to the beam. And in the forward direction, so beam will go out on this way. See, there are these stainless steel cups, you know, there are two telescopes. Telescopes means delta E telescope. We have a thin surface barrier detector and we have a thick surface barrier detector. The thin one will stop, will reduce the energy of the charged particles like proton, alpha, and so on. And the thick one will stop permanently. So, a, a two dimensional plot of delta E and E, the signal of this delta E and E will, if you see, if you recall the formula. D, D by dx equal to mz square by E, the stopping power formula. So D versus E is a hyperbola. D versus E will give you this hyperbola for different masses like proton, neutron, helium-3, helium-4 and so on. And you can put a gate on this bananas to get the energy spectra. You can sum the delta E plus E to get energy spectra. You can take the total area to get the total counts. So, Whatever counts you get from these experiments, these counts are related to n again n sigma phi instead of n sigma phi, number of target atoms per centimeter square. Now you are doing it at a particular angle. So we don't have sigma, you have the d sigma by d omega, that is called the differential cross section. And this is the total charge, total number of particles, which you can measure on your Faraday cup. So you identify the different particles by delta E telescope, this assembly as you have shown here. And you generate the two dimensional plot for different particles that are produced. So it is the particles that are emitted in a nuclear reaction. And then you can find out the energy spectra of these particles. You can integrate over the energy to get the total cross section. So cross section for charge particle induced reaction by online mode will give you differential cross section. 
at a particular at a particular angle and that you can then try to you know uh, integrate to get the total cross section over the angle so that is the kind of experiments one does if you are doing online experiment you do in delta e telescope if you are doing offline you can do by measurement of activity of the radioactive residues so this is how you can measure the cross section for charged particle induced yes so i'll stop here and the next lecture i'll give the different type of reactions that take place the type of reaction mechanisms in the next lecture thank you very much